Thank you for this mail and Yari for organizing. I actually say thanks for all the volunteers that have made this possible. Every every year we come to this and it's we just together have a tour. So thank you. Careful. So this is the motivating question that I had about three years ago was what's the difference between the query and a program is a very different query and program. And um, when you think of a query, you think of one thing, you think of a program query, you think of something in SQL, something about this long, um, that does a certain kind of thing, which is, you know, it's used to read only, retrieves data from a database. Um, you know, if you have a table of breath, well, it's a program, will do something perhaps more complex, it's usually about this long, um, or maybe it's a stack of code this long. Um, written in a querying language like Java or C or Python or whatever. Um, so I wanted to explore the boundary between the two and whether this was an artificial boundary that could be broken now. Um, and I, I want to focus on a particular, particular problem, which I call data parallel problems. It's not the only thing that parallel is good for, but it was an area that I thought was not very well served. So consider this problem, which is. The problem of indexing the web or indexing a whole bunch of documents is, you know, a problem that, uh, I don't know, you know, Google will have to solve in the early days. Um, and a lot of the, uh, you know, Padoop came out of this, out of solving this problem as well. So you just imagine you've got a set of text files, documents, and you want to convert it into an index to basically find all the words in that document, in those documents. Um, with all the words, you know, document containing all of the words that begin with A over here and all the words that begin with Z over here. Um, and let's just suppose that the number of documents is so large it doesn't fit in the memory of one machine. So the conventional way of solving this is to um, divide, decompose the documents into words, to uh, split each word into an individual record and then shuffle those records so that the words beginning with A end up in the left tab reducer, and the words beginning with X, Y, or Z end up in this right tab reducer. Um, and this shuffle here is a basically a complex distributed source uh, that ensures that every record gets to the right place. Um, there's a simplified version of this called word count where you're not interested in finding the document IDs, but just interested in how many occurrences the word art var call it. So we've replaced, instead of building a list of document IDs, we're just building accounts, but it's essentially the same problem. Um, it's a kind of a dumb problem, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a useful problem that illustrates the capabilities of uh, data parallel systems and programming languages. So um, data parallel programming is generally done with fetch processing with an info that's much larger than memory. Um, and the nature of the problem is you can process horizontal slices of the data, uh, recombine the results and still get the same result. So it's some, what people sometimes call embarrass, an embarrassingly parallel problem, where you don't require a free time to coordination. Um, but it's still a tough problem to solve. Um, so here's how you could solve this problem. I'm using the language standard ML here. Who's heard of standard ML? few people. Who's heard of Haskell? Okay, a few more. So, standard ML is basically the direct ancestor of Haskell. Um, I chose standard ML because it's got some of the complexity that's been added to Haskell over the years isn't there in standard ML. Um, and I wanted a language which was simple enough because my target audience is kind of people that are writing SQL today. Um, so anyway, in this, uh, we define a function, mapper, um, so we're using the map reduced paradigm. You have the, the, the mapper is a function that applies to every input line. The reducer is how you collect the output together. And, uh, you can write simple functions. So the, uh, the mapper is just takes, takes a single line and converts it into a list of words in that line. The reducer, um, takes an individual word of account and sums the counts together. So if you've got Two, one record with two occurrences of aardvark, another record with one occurrence of aardvark, it emits aardvark three, right? 
Um, and then you apply MapReduce as a higher order function. So MapReduce is a function that's built into the system. You pass it the two little functions you just wrote, give it the list, which is the seven documents, and it produces a result. So this is the entire program. I've right? done all that's done all of this. The complexity is all hidden in this MapReduce function, which is what Hadoop does, right? So that's that's your framework. But you have written very little code and you've used essentially a functional programming language to do it. So I'm I'm arguing here that Hadoop is a functional program language. Um and so is Spark and and I claim uh, so is most database. Um so, by the way, here's how you write it in SQL. Um, the problem is, well, does anyone see why this would be difficult to write in SQL? The problem is this is really just this function here, split. Split is not a built-in function in SQL. So it's kind of ironic that the easiest thing of all, which is splitting lines into individual words, is the reason you can't do it in SQL. Because of that, you leave SQL and you end up using something much more complex. So I started saying, well, what would we have to add to SQL in order that it can solve this? Or alternatively, what can I add to a language like standard ML to make it a little, to make the solution a little bit more like SQL? There's a preview of what it looks like in Morale, and you'll see it looks very much like the SQL. Uh, uh, but it uses a split function, which, as we'll see, is pretty easy to define. i um, already covered a lot of this. So yeah, the options are to extend SQL, to add um, functions into queries. Uh, if you're going to add functions, uh, especially higher order functions, you need a good type system with generics, function types, and so forth. Um, um, uh, or you could take a functional programming language, you could add relational algebra to it, and then pretty much everything else in the language would just keep the same. So most of them, in my day job, I'm, you know, the original developer of Apache CalSite. In my day job, I spent an awful lot of time seeing what is the most, how far can we stretch SQL, right? How can we make the best possible implementation of SQL? This is kind of a side project of mine saying, well, if there was a success, at, and by the way, SQL wins 99% of the time. Um, but if there was a success to SQL, what would it look like? This is what, uh, these are the questions I'm asking here. So Morel is a functional programming language derived from standard ML, except it would list comprehen comprehensions and other relational operators. Like standard ML, Morel has parametric and algebraic data types with Henley MLDF type inference. Morel is implemented in Java, is optimized and executed using a combination of techniques from functional programming language compilers and database program optimizers. So I feel like get to the point early, so you know we know what we're dealing with here. Um, and it's at that early stage, right? It's, uh, it's still experimental, contributions are welcome, it's not running in production anywhere, but I think it has a, a lot of possibilities. Um, so, uh, and by the way, I'm not going to apologize. There's a lot of code in this. I'm trying to convince you to use new language. So there's a lot of examples of this language. So, and, um, all right, quick intro to standard ML. Um, so this stuff all runs in morale because morale is a superset of standard ML. So there are constants, you know, strings, integers, uh, for some bizarre reason, negative numbers use a tilde rather than the minus sign. Um, it has lists built in. Um, the third, the, this example here and say, uh, this is a lambda, in other words, a, uh, a, a function value. So this particular function is something that takes an integer and returns, uh, tells you whether it's odd or even. Um, this is a, a tuple for pair. You can think of this as an anonymous record. It's a record with two fields that are actually they're literally called one and two. Um, and uh, here is a record. So it's got multiple values and named fields. Um, let me see. So you can assign, I think variables is the wrong word. I'm assigning it to a, a, a variable. Uh, in, in 
uh, standard ML is a single assignment language, so you can assign a value to a variable, you can't reassign it. Uh, so it's a, if, if you wanted to do things like leap to write recursive functions, um, and it, it, it sounds restricted, but it works out perfectly in practice. Um, then we've taken that is odd function and assigned it to a value. So we've now got a function, uh, a variable whose value is a function. Um, the effect is exactly the same as if you use the spun syntactic sugar, uh, uh, except, well, except I've got a zero to one as book. Um, so, and then yes, when I, when I've got a function is odd, I can apply it to a value. I don't need to use parentheses or something. If I just write function value, it just applies the function to the byte. And then this last one left, I could basically assign a value to X and then apply this function and then define the value, define the function, apply the function to the value and we are. So this is a way of defining create local definitions and then applying the function. Um, I could define recursive functions. Um, I pretty much have to use this phone di format for that. It's di it's difficult. You can't create a recursive lambda because it can't ref because it doesn't have a name. It can't refer to itself. But here's an example of the factorial function. And higher order functions are functions that take functions as arguments or return functions. So there's a couple that are built in. So um, we've got filter which takes a list applies a lambda to each element of the list and returns the elements of the list that uh, for which that lambda return is true. Um, we've also got map that applies a function to every element of the list. So in this case, we've got a list, oops, we've got a list of 10 integers. Um, we filter out the even ones and it, we get 0, 2, 4, 6, 8. Um, and then we apply uh, map which triples something we get zero three six nine of the twenty seven. So uh you if you're a SQL aficionado, you will recognize we're basically doing relational operations here. Um so let's look at this one. Um I've created a table here I've basically assigned to EMPS a list of records. So it's you think of this as a table with four rows in it, I could say list.filter, and I'm, I'm applying a lambda to each element of this. So I'm basically saying, find all the employees where department pepper is thirst. Oh, this pound step, no, this is a special built-in function that extracts a particular field or something. So this is equivalent to this SQL here. So I think you can see, in, in standard ML, all of the elements of relational algebra, they're just rather difficult to use. And um, uh, let's look at a more complex example. I want to apply the filter function and then apply a map function. Because of the order of function evaluation, I actually have to write them the filter on the second line, map on the first line, because it evaluates inside out. Much easier to write in SQL. I uh, just use the where clause and the select clause. Um, this is also called up to Spark, right? use the filter function and the select function. It's, no, it's not a coincidence. All of these languages do similar things in a similar way because they all boil back to relational algebra. Um, in the relational algebra, this is the way CalSide would think about it. It's a set of boxes connected by arrows. The Jaro is a stream of records that we've evaluated. And lastly, in Morel, um, it uh, looks very much like the SQL. We decide to put the from clause first because that's where the data originates. So you can read a morel expression from top, from top, from top to bottom. Um, it's also in a little way similar to a Unix pipeline where you read from left to right. So we're building it, you know, a chain of data flows. Um, oh yeah. So one criticism of that, I think I, in my opinion, it's a pretty major criticism of Spark in that, um, this looks like an integrated language. It looks fairly concise, but there's actually two languages there on the screen. This here is a, is a Scala expression. It's actually a, it's actually a shorthand for lambda, or lambda, right? Here's another lambda here, and so uh, the Scala compiler will deal with this, and yet the filter and the select are in a sense part of another language, which is the Spark language, right? 
relational algebra provided by Spark. So the Spark compiler will get to work on this thing, reduce some, I don't know, object code or whatever. And then a few microseconds later, the, the SCARP of uh, the Spark optimizer will get to work on this. But because this has been converted into a Lambda, it's really difficult for Spark to figure out what's going on. And so, if, you know, it, it would be, Spark is going to do distributed execution of this, but it can't really reorder operations and do the kind of optimizations, even simple optimizations like pushing down filters and film pruning that any SQL optimizer would do. So I think Spark and, and you know, this applies to Flink and uh, uh, Flume, Flume Java. Uh, it applies to any of those what I call builder languages, but they're essentially two languages and they fall vastly short of the, of the kind of things that SQL could do, which is why it, there's a real advantage in moving to something like Feral, where you can apply it, you can write these programs and then have the same SQL optimization techniques applied. Okay, so introducing Morale. I've already given you a, um, a preview. Uh, the main contribution of Morale is this from operator. Um, the way I look at it is we've added, uh, if you know, you've got languages which have first, pro well, all languages that we now have first class processing of like integers, right? Plus, minus, multiply, whatever. Uh, most languages have strings as a first class type. All we're doing in Morel is making lists and collections of first class type. We're building stuff into the language, not into the standard library, but into the, into the language for processing lists. Um, and the from operator is that construct. And it has a number of sub clauses that correspond to the sub clauses in SQL. We've also, this is syntactic sharib, but rather than saying panamant depth no of e, you could just say e dot depth no. It's just, it's just a more natural way of writing a, a field. And likewise, when we construct records, uh, you should, you don't have to say uh, depth no equals x dot depth no. You just say uh, x dot depth. Don't have to, it's it's like the way SQL will derive aliases of a select list without you, uh, you know, having to type them out. Do you have a question? Yes. So when you say you're building a list of the blank, you're just a mini in or it's more like a grade rather than a set con scale construct this best goal without. Uh, you yeah, it's, I mean, they're, they're more like unordered lists, the kind of thing that SQL works with. And, um, you are definitely not linked lists. So I'm, I'm they, they are unordered collections, uh, and you're working on them using relational algebra operations. So you could, yeah, definitely don't want to be saying, take the first record off, take the next, next record off. You're, you're applying relational algebra. So apply this map function to every element in the list, aggregate on this. So I, I, I guess I should have said apply adding word relations to the language. Um, the, the only reason I didn't say that is when I say relations, you think sets of records, and it turns out these operations can work just as well on sets of integers, or sets of pairs, or sets of string. And so we don't, we don't, we're not just restricted to records. Um, so I'm not going to go into th This is how you'd write a join in standard ML. I'm not going to go into it. It's horrible. Um, uh, but. Here it is translated into morale, and then with the additional syntactic sugar, it ends up looking very much like SQL. Uh, so, as you can see, you can do relational program in ML would want to, or L makes it possible. Uh, back to word count again. Here's this split function I mentioned. So this is literally word count from the bare metal. Um, so we have derived in, in three four lines, we've written the split function. We've written this helper function split zero that takes a set of words and then this list here, the first argument is the set of characters in a word. Sorry, the set of characters on the line. And it chucks the line up into individual words to return to a list of words. Um, so I'm not going to go into the details, but you know, this works. And then this thing, which looks very much like a query, uh, is doing the shuffle and notification. So, uh, yeah, and I run it on a set of words and it produces the right answer. And you know, you can do this, you could download morale from GitHub and, uh, you know, it, 
less than a minute if you can run this example. So this is running it in local mode, um, but Morel is something that could very easily run as, as distributed paragraph. The paragraph would put the same. So yeah, I call this functional programming in this whole, which is writing a small function that operates on a string or an integer um, and just saves your typing. Um, whereas this is what I call functional programming in a large, where what the things that you're operating on are relations with the billion records. So, you know, MapReduce is an example of functional programming at the large. Um, or if you wanted to write a, you know, linear algebra system, uh, verting matrices and, you know, computing, uh, what you call uh, dot products of vectors with a million, a million entries in them. Uh, that's the kind of thing you'd want to do functional programming at the large. Uh, and Morel allows you to do that pop -ush. And the, the way of, you know, viewed through the lens of functional programming, what an optimizer does is it applies algebraic identities. Um, and some of the optimizations that, for example, um, the sum of a sum is a sum. If you want to compute, if you've got a billion rows, billion integers, you want to sum them up, you know, you can sum them up in individual groups because, um, the sum operates the commutes, right? So you use the optimizer uses that algebraic property and is able to find more efficient ways of doing things. Um, a lot of these functions have those algebraic properties that could be used by an optimizer. It's, it's not only the, the relational operations uh, that have our algebraic properties that are interesting. Um, here's a function. Uh, it's a function that returns a relation. So given the imps table, um, it's basically running a query. Um, and, uh, so there's two functions of interest here. There's this emp2, which is a function that returns a relation. You can think of this as like a SQL view. So if I use this in my query here, right, it's like evaluating a SQL view and Morel's compiler will inline it. So it's, it, it works exactly the same way that a SQL view is work. It inlines the AST, prints it the way the things prints away the things that are not needed. But the other function in this is this thing here, this lambda. So this comp is an actual column in the, in the, the it's one of the four fields in the record and its value is a function that uh, basically will compute the, uh, I don't know if it, this is a kind of a garbage function for it. If you will compute what the compensation of this employee should be, right? So um, functions are first class values in this language. So you know, the value of a column can be a function. No surprise to functional programmers, but that's kind of a crazy eye for see. And sure enough, when I apply comp to a thousand, it produces a value. So there we've got C or 603 of the results of this. Um, so now Morel looks, the Morel's from expression looks a lot like SQL. Um, the thing is it doesn't, you can chain the thing, in, you can chain the operators in any order. But in this case, it's working more like a kind of Unix pipeline. So I can start from E and M. So this is basically saying, assign this variable E for every row of employees. Uh, that then I'm, I can use an order by clause. Um, ordering on department of an ID, what's going to come out of this is another variable called V, except it's iteration or a stiffer. Um, yield is kind of like the select clause, so I can compute some new fields. And what, you know, I'm going to compute a new field called name length, right? So in the next step, a where clause, I can reference that name length that's just been created. So as you can see, there's no particular need for this. SQL has a strict evaluation order of its clauses that is not ironically the same as they appear on the page in every SQL program and others that select happens after where or before having, right? Um, but this one, you can just, just keep on adding these clauses. Uh, uh, so as long as each clause refers to the variables that were propagated by the previous tool. Um, so yeah, so here we are. Um, here is it, it is a morale that the crawl of SQL query because of the restrictions on clause order, uh, the equivalent SQL query has I've had to use for slice 
statements nested four deep to get the same effect. And you'd be hard pressed to f- find the right order to read the clauses. Um, you could kind of imagine doing it in a in a programming language with loops. You know, the outer loop is the employees, and then it's got an if, which represents the first with air and so forth. Um, it's rather it's really difficult to express it in a in a block structured language like Java. Um, yeah. So Caltai, which is I guess why I'm here in Apache Car. The relationship with Cal, well, let me just first introduce CalSite. It's a, it's a framework for building data engines. Most of the data engines are, you know, we use SQL or JDC. Um, but we also support other front end languages. So Morel is potentially a front end language, a, a new front end language for CalSite. Um, the heart of, of, that of, uh, CalSite is relational algebra and a query planner, which uses rewrite rules. Relational rewrite rules that take one relational operation and convert it into another relational operation that has the same effect as this and is possibly fast. So, um, so the kind of thing CalSite does is take a query like this um, uh, and convert it into relational algebra so that its aggregate corresponds to this group by clause and filter. Correspondence series of its uh and receive vec words. Um and it optimizes by applying these rewrite rules. So as we can see here, this filter applies as has age feet employee age greater than fifty. Um it's referencing a field that only comes from the left hand side of this join, right? So it makes sense if we push this down, right? We basically filter out the employees before we put them into the join. That means the join has less work to do so the query finishes faster. So that's one of like 200 or 300 rewrite roles that CalSite has. That's the kind of thing, the kind of way that CalSite worked. So I integrated Morel with CalSite. It's optional. You can run you can run Morel on in-memory data structures, but it's also straightforward to integrate CalSite. So when you start up Morel with the with standard options, it comes with what look like variables. One is called Food Mart and the other is called Scott. These are actually what database people would call schemas or databases, right? So Food Mart actually contains an account table, a currency table, a customer table, and some of the Scott contains a department table, a employee table, the bonus table, right? So when I say Scott, though, at that time, I'm evaluating the department table at Scott. And it's actually going and generating some logic secret to execute this. Um, so if I write something more complex, um, you know, from D and Scott.dat where not exists, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, again, it's generating a SQL query to execute this. Um, you can see this is, you know, the same as a SQL query. But the point is, you're in this morale language where you've got the type system and then you've got the ability to write your own functions and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, um, in order to enable CalSides, all I need to do is set hybrid to true. So when it sees a query like this, it will go and produce a plan, which is, at the very top level, Morel is decided and you know, executed in CalSides, and then all of this stuff below it is CalSide relational operators. So it's taken this code pushed all of it into relational algebra, and this could be run on any of the backends that CalSite supports. And, uh, I, yeah, I don't have an illustration of it here, but if there are any fragments in this that are not supported by SQL, Morel can wrap those fragments in a special user-defined function that runs CalSite, so CalSite can run the remaining bits of Morel inside CalSite. So it's a way of aggressively pushing stuff into the relational system. Hopefully over time in CalSides, the backends CalSides forwards will start implementing more of these functional features. Um, so the interesting thing for me is I'm very familiar with the interesting thing about this project for me. I, I obviously um, spend a lot of time doing query optimization. But learning how functional programs are optimized has been very interesting. Was a was a great feat of uh, secrets at Glasgow Glasgow Haskell compiler in Um 
I learned a whole lot about how Haskell does uh, its optimization. They can't use cost as much because they don't have cost available. Um, but it's, you know, and it's based on Lambda calculus. The core of Haskell is, is Lambda calculus. Um, uh, but nevertheless, there's an awful lot in common between the two things. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, inlining a function is very much like SQL view expatch. And inlining, that's, that's the word. It's even in the title of the paper, right? Inlining is the, is the main way that Haskell optimizes its work. So it's in, it's been very interesting bringing those two disciplines together in, into one language. Um, let's see, how are we doing for time? Ten more minutes? In final. Okay, cool. Um, so recursively defined sets. So if it, as you as you can see, I'm trying to bridge the gap between two programming paradigms, query languages like SQL, um, functional programming languages like standard ML and, um, and the Pascal. Well, two isn't enough. So, um, I decided to look at another kind of problem, which is difficult to solve for both, namely recursively defined sets. Um, and, uh, so there's a family of languages, well, not a family of languages, data log is a, a language for databases um, that came out of the logic programming world. I, I kind of call it a deductive programming language since it's working in logic, but data log is as powerful as SQL. In fact, in a couple of key areas, it is strictly more powerful than SQL. Um, so, um, and data log, even though it implements Relational algebra, relational calculus does it in a very, very different way than SQL. So it's very instructive to look at this language. By the way, the way data long works is also very amenable to things like graph problems, where you basically want to do a traversal over a graph. So I decided to look at can I make morale handle the kind of problems that data log could solve. Uh, recursively defined sets are these things that are difficult for relational languages to solve. Um, so let me first of all define relationally defined sets. Um, the familiar example to everyone is Fibonacci numbers. So basically say the first Fibonacci number is one, the second Fibonacci number is one, and then any subsequent Fibonacci number is the sum of the previous two Fibonacci numbers. You can use that recurrence relation to then generate the full set of Fibonacci numbers, right? One, one, two, three, five, eight, thirty. Um, so, um, yeah. So this is a simple example of recursively defined set. Why is the broccoli on the screen? Well, this particular Romanesco broccoli, uh, the the Fibonacci sequence is so I don't know. It's such basic mathematics because it's naturally in nature. And, um, and so the number of like Florida schemes tend to follow this sequence that one of the rings will have two, the next one will have three, the next one will have five, the next one will I the, the broccoli isn't doing math, that is to <laughs> But this stuff is so fundamental that broccoli happened on it by accident the same way the Fibonacci happened on it by accident. There's another recurs recursively defined set but transitive closure. Um, you know, problems like I can get from uh, uh, city A, city B across a bridge, and I can get from B to C, you know, where are all the places I can walk without falling into water, right? Um, so, um, transitive closure is a, is a way of finding the connected areas of a graph, of a directed graph. So, you typically define a transitive closure, so you've got a, a relation R, a relation is a set of pairs, like walk, if I could walk from you know, from here to there, um, from city one to city two, and I can walk from city two to city three. Um, so R is a set of pairs, and the S, the transitive closure, is defined to be R, helium, the joint of R and S. So, um, which is to say, the places I can get from city one are, um, the place I can get from city one directly Union with the places I can get from if I can get to city one and if I can get to city two and city three, um, then it's the transitive closure for starting from R 
union with the chance to close are starting with from S, the, sorry, from uh, City 2 and City 3. So it's recursively device, but it works. It's a, it's a well-formed uh, definition of this set. Um, there's, a, there's a parallel way of doing it. So here I'm starting off with sets and I'm applying relational operations or set operations to union and join. I can do it in terms of logic which I can say, if X and Y is in set, it is in the set, that's a Boolean expression, right? Uh, or X and Y is in the set, if X and Y are in R, or there's some C, like 52, where um, uh, X and Z are in R, and X, C, and Y are in S. Um, so that's an, that's an equivalent statement. One of them is in terms of set theory, the other one is in terms of logic. Um, if I convert that into a computer language, uh, you know, replacing, you know, the, the this symbol with four, right? Um, uh, then we get something that looks a little bit more like a functional borrowed language. So um, we'll come back to this in a minute. So my first attempt to, to do recursively defined sets, um, I was interested in an answer, computing, yeah, four minutes, okay. Uh, confusing the ancestors' relations. So you've got here are the set of parents, right? So Aaron Dill is the parent of Elrond. Uh, I don't know, Arwen is the daughter of Elrond. So um, my first attempt was to write a recursive function. So I write an ancestors function where it is the parents' relation union with the drawing of the parents' relation and the ancestors' relation. You'd think that would clerk um, based on the formula that I wrote on the previous page. But in practice, you get a stack overflow error because the ancestors relation is calling the ancestors relation. It doesn't do any work. If it, it doesn't do any work before it calls itself. So it's just, it, it just, it, it needs to compute the answer before it has computes the answer. So it just, it, it just doesn't work in a functional bird. There's a few languages that have made this work, including SQLs with recursive, but it uses some trickery. Um, so in SQL, I can write create few ancestors using with recursive. You'll see in with recursive, I am literally I'm referencing ancestors here. Let me see. That's this, this is supposed yes. Oh, there we go, torque head H. Um, so I've defined with recursive A, and A references itself. And they made, they hacked SQL to make it smart enough to know that if I'm doing a union, then it, the union is only ever going to get larger and it reaches a fixed point and that's well defined. But that's a hack you can only do once, and in SQL, this kind of recursion only works for unions. And I wanted something better than that. Datalog solves this problem elegantly without any hacks. So you've got these things, which are statements of true true facts, right? Elodil is parent of Elrond. This is a this is a fact. This is the base, the the the, 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 uh, the set of base facts. Then you've got these derived facts here. X is an ancestor of Y. If X is a parent of X, if X is a parent of Y, or if X is of X is a parent of Z, some Z, and Z is an ancestor of Y. And then you run it to data log and it works. Okay. So what is it about data log that's, that's, that's actually successful? Well, Morel's first attempt failed because we were using a recursive function that was trying to return the set. And Morel didn't, unlike SQL, Morel didn't know that it's supposed to look to find a partial order on end results and see when it's getting to fix. There are some lap languages in academia that actually do that. They define fixed points, and uh, I don't know what you call them, um, particle orders on their results, so forth. Um, but from, with inspiration from data log, um, we said, well, let's compute in terms of the Boolean function instead. Okay. But this is the second thing. I said, really just mirrored what data log did. You define this Boolean function to say when X is ancestor of Y, it's an ancestor of Y if it's in the parents relation, or if it's ancestor of X, C, Y. Because I'm calling this the different arguments here, this, this recursion will terminate. It will give me an answer. Okay. 
and then I can write a query, and this works. The only problem is I've introduced this new operator such that, such that, so the usual stuff in the front clause, I have a list on the right, and then I just iterate over that list. This is kind of saying run the machine backwards, okay? It said find all values of ancestor such that this is true. This is running the machine backwards. This is setting, starting off from the solution and, you know, working uh, uh, backwards towards the, you know, the, it's, it's starting off with the, the result of the function working towards the arguments of the function. In relation algebra, it's simple enough that it can do that. So, I'll, this such that operator um, is, I'm very pleased with this. It is on the borderline between computer science and magic. But Datalog has done this, and I'm close to getting it to work in Calisite. So um, uh, it, I think it's a, a, a matter of days before it's working. Um, and it, it opens up a very interesting panorama of, of uh, it's in, not Calisite, Morel, uh, of, of Morel being able to do these kind of logic graph problems just as easily as relational algebra problems. So, what is the difference between a query and a program? There's no difference as long as you have the right language. Um, one that is a combination of functional query language and deductive languages, which for some play for the relatives. So, that's it. Um, I'd love contributions. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, and uh, if we have some time, do you have any time for questions? I think. I'll say, Adam, I'm uh, going to post these slides afterwards. I'll post them on uh, the Morale Lang uh, Twitter account. So if you want to copy the slides, uh, there for it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? This. What is this? But this the name for like a gremlin? Is this like gremlin? Yes, so, so you have one on one the one that you have simple tell it like that's the active problem that you have merged. What is this the, the what is this traversal thing with us when you would travel and know what's like this as a problem? Yeah. Uh you say what there's a kind of language that does what's the name for the kind of language that does this? A remnant. So I've had you I know, I'm familiar we are somewhat familiar with Kremlin. I don't know the how the um how they compare? Uh, yes, it, you can compare stuff, yes. Okay. I I think the difference is Gremlin is focused on graph processing, and I wanted I wanted it to this to be a general purpose like which okay. um that looks you could solve conventional problems in it, um and then escape into relational algebra or or graph processing if if as some problem uh, uh, beefed as opposed to having to switch, use one language for the graph parts of your problem, another language for the relational parts of your problem, and another language for the other parts. Because switching languages is a very painful thing to do. And most people, in fact, is dumps, right? Most people start solving a problem in one language and they will just spay it on that one. Yes. So, uh, and somebody showed some good examples uh, where you add some Java, you add some SQL, you add some Word. Yep. Uh, and the question is, you know, I think one of the fascinating things that this sort of you can, you know, sauce plus is one after the other until you get to think about. What do you think about, you know, Java has that, like, dot stream of filter dot light, which seems to accomplish maybe the same thing. Um, and then this kind of leads me to thought, you know, with Python, you can get the AST modified on the fly. So rather than have people learn how to think functional, because SNL is, you know, these first beginners quite difficult, you know, taking a Python filter and, and, you know, sort of being able to figure out, think that you something like the Java stream you had done from the bit with people under the foot. Yeah, this goes back to my earlier remarks about those things I said about in Spark also apply to Java streams, uh, which is there's really two languages there. There's a relational algebra of the dot app, dot filter, and then there's the lambda that's embedded in it. Bad of it. 
their language is not the language compiler is not capable of optimizing both simultaneously. They are different. So they don't Java stream. I'm not really sure what is the ideal, the sweet spot use case for Java streams, but it's certainly not good for our like distributed execution, the kind of thing you do for Spark. Um, so and people aren't replacing their databases with Java streams. So I would claim if you're going to do functional programming, which you're using Java, Java streams or you're using Spark, you're doing functional programming. Why not use a functional programming language that's designed for the DAOs? Uh, as opposed to, you no, know, ever this dot, okay, the, this, this fluid programming, you get used to it, but it, honestly, the first time you see it, that's weirder than any of the code I put on the my opinion. You've all just got used to it. Because we've done it so many times. Um, so language integrated query that's in C sharp and F sharp, I believe, um, has both the SQL like sort of query language and then it's got uh, something like the stream API sort of sitting underneath it. Is there anything in the Morale code base that if I was willing to forgo some of the niceties of the syntactic sugar that the the functional language is going to give me that I call into and get some of the functionality? I mean this is definitely a very similar uh, I when I was designing Morale I interacted with uh just the designer of C sharp. He was he was actually the best did not make the number of courses kept speed unbounded. Um, I mean, F sharp is a is is a functional language that has the language integration into it. The thing is, there are still braces around your queries. You can still see in the query, uh, here's here's my program and here's a query. Um, so it's the language the, the the two languages are not integrated with each other. So they're integrated in that they're on the same page and they're half double quotes. Um, but there's still a d divided line. And if morale, I mean, you have just, that line is all deep and pressles. It's a, it's a single language. And that's, I think there are benefits to be had with a, with a single language. I mean, imagine if you had to, like, to, in order to do floating point processing, imagine you had to leave Java to go to a, in a better language, it would be a total little fright. Uh, it's just nice to have floating points built into the Java. And I claim, even in something like F sharp, uh, the, the relation algebra is kind of off, off to the side and not fully integrated with the language. So. Just a question from Julian and my audience, but. Uh, the standard ML approach to some of the queries are very ugly compared to the moral approach. If you were to be replacing a some some tubes process with this, but you envision intentionally limiting the standard ML ability so that he had to put using the more moral charts. I don't think you'd have to I would just naturally use whatever they you know, Java programmers have to decide whether the for each of Java streams or a full egg breath. There's several constructs that achieve the same thing. Within the team, you just have a talk about all the team culture release, which everyone agrees, which is the most readable code. Um, I think people make a simpler call that. All right, thank you, everybody.